So hi everyone. Uh, before going into the details, uh, uh, let's just uh, get a high level idea Good. of the paper, uh, which I think will make it easier to intuitively understand the uh, conditioning augmentations better, which is the main portion part of this paper. So firstly, this is a general model, uh, a diffusion model that takes a class input and outputs a high resolution image. Now, a uh, cascading pipeline is just splitting this one step process into multiple steps. So the general idea is the first model takes the class as input, and then the second model takes the output of the first model as input, and so on, finally producing a high resolution image. Let's just see how the authors use this setup. They first use a base model to generate a 32 cross 32 low resolution image from the class condition. Then they subsequently generate a 64 cross 64 image using a super resolution model from the 32 cross 32 one. And then finally, they generate a high resolution 128 cross 128 or 256 cross 256 using a second super resolution block from the 64 cross 64 image. So the natural question is, why do cascading when we can have all these in a single step? So uh, the most of the sample generation is done in the base model in low resolution, which is computationally efficient and generates better sample. Another thing is that we can train and tune the models of the pipeline individually, which helps us in generating better sample in high resolution too. This is all good, but everything till now was already known. Cascading pipeline was known. It was previously used in GANs and other models. Uh, super resolution diffusion models were also known. Uh, so what the paper did extra is, first of all, they made the cascading pipeline actually work for the diffusion model. And secondly, and most importantly, they showed adding augmentations to in-between steps actually help in this. The author termed these augmentations as conditional augmentations. Many augmentations might work, but they showed that Gaussian noise and Gaussian blur augmentations and some horizontal flips are enough to generate state-of-the-art samples. So let's just look in each of these steps in detail. First, let's concentrate on the base model and first super resolution model. This generates a low resolution 64 cross 64 image. And the authors find adding Gaussian noise as conditional augmentation helps. But now adding Gaussian noise must be very common to us, right? Because we just do that in the diffusion forward process. So the interesting thing would be if we can use those noisy samples as the augmented samples. So let's see how the authors do that. So first, let's identify where in diffusion process is our output image. So this is the diffusion process, uh, process of the base model and uh, the same output image is the one that gets generated after the full reverse process. So the noisy sample would be at something at like, let's say at step 101, or maybe at 501, or maybe at step 1001. So these are all noisy versions, uh, which can be used as augmented versions of our output image of the base model. Now we need to check how to get these noisy versions. So first way is pretty straightforward. We take the original image, that is the ground truth image and use the diffusion process, diffusion forward process equation to get the noisy samples at respective time steps. But this can be only leveraged during the training time since only then we will have access to the ground truth. Second way is also pretty intuitive. Uh, first, we generate an image using the complete reverse process. Then we use the diffusion forward process uh, 
uh, diffusion forward process equation to get the noisy samples like the previous one. The third way is interesting. Here, we stop the reverse process at a time step and sample the noisy uh, image at that respective time step. Like here, we stop after sampling from 101 time step, or maybe here where we stop after sampling from 501 time step. So this way of generating samples is called truncated or conditional augmentation, since we are truncating the reverse process at certain time step, like here. While the other way is obviously non-truncated version, uh, because we complete the whole reverse process and then generate the noisy versions. Obviously, there are reasons where to use the truncated augmentations and non-truncated augmentations. In case we are using truncated augmentations, it should be faster than non-truncated ones because we don't have to complete all the time steps. But there is still a small problem with this. Like, let's say we want to have, uh, we want to save multiple time steps. Uh, let's say these two. Now, if we want to use both of these noisy samples, we need to store both of these. So this would take two X memory. But in non-truncated case, we can just store the final generated image and then use the forward process to get the noisy version when required. This would take only one X space. So if we want to increase the number of noisy samples, uh, it won't be memory efficient if we use the truncated conditional augmentation. So choosing between truncated and non-truncated conditional augmentation will be some form of time versus memory trade-off. So we figured out how this portion works. Now let's check how the base model works. Uh, so this is the algorithm. This is just class condition, classifier free diffusion process. Uh, still, let's just walk through it once. First, we sample a class and the original image. We pick a random time step. We create the noisy version using the forward process equation. And then finally, we use our unit model to predict the noise added. And we repeat this again and again till the loss converges. So now we know how the best model works and the, how the augmentations are done. Uh, one thing I want to add here is that since we need to do experiment with multiple augmented noisy samples, each time step will give us a different super resolution pipeline. So rather than training multiple models for each time steps, what we can do is that we can amortize the whole process. We can concat the time step information as a conditioning to the super resolution model. So let's check out how this thing is done in the super resolution model. So first we sample the high resolu resolution image, uh, this one, the generated low resolution image and the class. Then we sample some form of time steps and accordingly get the noisy versions. So there would be two noisy versions. One noisy version would be the truncated or non-truncated conditional augmentation that we have already seen. That is ZS. And the another would be from the forward process of the super resolution model. Finally, we train the unit by predicting the noise added. The only difference is here we will use two extra conditioning information the noisy sample and the time step at which the noisy sample was generated. Now we are done with the training we need to check out how the sampling stage will work because here we won't have access to the ground truth data. So firstly, if we use the truncated augmentation, we can just stop the reverse process at the respective time step of the base model to get the noisy sample. Or if we use the non-truncated augmentation, we have to complete the whole reverse process. Then only we can use the forward process equation to generate the noisy samples.
Generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. Finally, we use this nice example to get the 64 cross 64 output using the super resolution model as we have seen. And this covers this class condition to 64 cross 64 part. The last model up samples this 64 cross 64 to 256 cross 256 or 128 cross 128. This is more or less similar to the previous super resolution model that we have seen. The only thing is that the augmentations are different. So here we use the Gaussian blur augmentation along with some random flipping to get the desired samples. I won't go through the training loop again. It's more or less same like the last one. Uh, we use conditioning on lower resolution image and then unit predicts the noise. So finally, we are done understanding the whole pipeline. Now let's check how this whole setup performs against the other baseline. So in the task of 64 cross 64 image generation, it clearly outperforms other GAN or diffusion based models. But in the case of 128 cross 128 high resolution image generation, it performs slightly less than the Logan model. Ultimately, in the task of 256 cross 256 high resolution image generation, it outperforms all other existing models. Thus, it achieves state of the art results among the classifier free diffusion models. Uh, now, Vijay shall continue with the experimentations that were done to make this cascading pipeline actually work. Thank you. Yeah, uh, next is the experimental results the authors were doing, doing on the cascading pipeline. Oh, one sec, before that I will use laser pointer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, here is the ca cascading pipeline architecture. Uh, consist, consisting of uh, one base model and the two super resolution models. Finally, uh, firstly, they are doing experiments on 64 cross 64 cascaded base model, which consists of one base model and one super resolution model. So before doing that, uh, they're setting up a, a strong baseline to compare the results of cascaded base model. Here is the setting up of 64 cross 64 class condition baseline model. They were using four down time steps for the model, and they were using uh, these are the four down time steps they are performing. And then they are using improved DDPM where the variance is not fixed and uh, it is learned. And, and also they are using dropout in the baseline model. With these changes, they got the best values of FID and the inception scores. Before going to see the results, here is the quick recap of terminology that the others were do, using during the experiments. The first is the trunc truncating at the time step S is equal to 250. It's nothing but they're stopping at that value and using that particular time step image. And next is the S of zero. It's nothing but they're generating complete denoised image. And next is the, here is the ground truth. Ground truth is nothing but the input image. And S of zero is the generated denoised image. 
on S of 250 is the truncated at the particular time step. Then we'll go into the experiment results. So uh, they started with the improved DDPM as the baseline model. So uh, they got the following results with the 2.44 as the FID score. And they made some improvements over the baseline, like improved DDPM, like adding dropout and increasing the time steps. Then they able to achieve better FID scores than the, than the first one. We'll come back to our cascading pipeline results. So um, initially they passed S of zero to the SR model. Over here, there is no augmentation we're performing on the generated image and they're able to achieve the following results. The 6.02 and the 5.38, 5.8, sorry, 5.84. Then they truncated the image at time step of 101. So they are passing the this as a 101 time step image to the SR model. Then they're able to achieve these results. If you see uh, the earlier one, like S, S is equal to zero and S is equal to 101, so over here, we are doing the condition augmentation on the, on this particular time step image. Then they pass the truncated image with the value of 1001 to the SR model. Then they got even better scores than compared to the previous ones. So we'll compare the all the results now. Uh, these are the non-cascaded results and these are the uh, cascaded results. We can clearly see uh, that condition augmentation helping to get the better FID scores as, as we increasing the time step. We can conclude that with the we, we can conclude the, with the results that condition augmentation is therefore crucial to improve the sample quality in this particular cascading pipeline. To further improve the sample quality at 64 cross 64 resolution, they, uh, they, found it to they found it helpful to increase the cascading pipeline starting with 32 cross 32 instead of 16 cross 16. So they, they made this change, they got even better results. These are the sample quality scores for truncated augmentation. The sample quality metrics improves and then degrade as the truncation time got increased. This indicates that the moderate amount of condition augmentation are beneficial to the sample quality of the cascading pipeline, but too much condition augmentation causes super resolution model to behave as the non-conditioned model. So there is no uh, use of doing uh, augmentation with increasing the, the time steps. Same kind of results for non-truncated conditioning and performing better than the condition baseline. So here the super resolution model is conditioned on the ground truth instead of the generated, generated data. What that means is, if you see, uh, we are not passing the uh, output of the baseline model to the input of the SR model. So here we are passing the ground truth, nothing but the input image. Generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. Here the, the sample quality monotically decreases as the truncation time is get increased. Condition augmentation is therefore therefore uh, helpful precisely when conditioning on the generated samples instead of the ground truth samples. Now for the low resolution to super resolution, we are going from uh, 64 cross 64 to 128 cross 128 or the 256 cross 256. Uh, they found that the Gaussian noise doesn't work in this case. So they tried Gaussian blurring. This found to be the effective that only for 50% of the training and not for not at the inference time. They made other uh, modifications like uh, increasing the batch training and uh, doing a random flip augmentation. These proved, <laughs> all these are helpful to improve the super resolution. 
Here we can see the authors experimented with the different standard deviations for the Gaussian blurring. The standard deviation in the range of uh, 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 performs better. They considered this as the baseline result. And they made further improvements by, uh, by doing class conditioning, uh, increasing batch size, and doing uh, augmentations like flip LR. Uh, here, LR is nothing but left to right flip. All these improvements are increasing the results at each time step, as we can see. They also perform the experiments on the different data sets, other than the uh, ImageNet data set. So they did their experiments on Elson bedroom. These two verify whether the condition augmentation is specific to ImageNet data set or is actually a valid setup. So as we can see in the table, condition augmentation actually works for the both the data sets. So the FID scores are getting improved. Thus proving that con con conditional augmentation actually helps. Next will the con conclusion. The final conclusion would be this paper is quite old. By old, I mean in this uh, dynamic field of generative models, research have been progressed a lot. Models like latent diffusion models or st stable diffusion models generate extremely good super resolution images. And they do all the diffusion steps in the latent, sp latent space as they are quite too fast as well. But the idea of cascading pipeline is extremely useful, which can be used in multiple tasks like setting up a baseline. Now Austin will take over. Hi everyone, hopefully this serves, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear can you. you. You can? Yeah, yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right, so hopefully this serves as a quick uh, recap of all the things we covered so far today, but um, I will start off with uh, a little bit of an introduction on the motivation to the paper um, in addition to the uh, analytical conclusion. But so the research team wanted to showcase the capabilities of the original diffusion formalism and introduce some simple, straightforward techniques uh, to enhance sample quality of these diffusion models. Um, the basic idea um, surrounding CDMs is to use the diffusion process to generate a series of intermediate images, each of which contains more detail than the previous. Um, so at each step, the model learns to predict the next image based on the sequences uh, and current images and the noise vectors being applied. Um, this process repeated multiple times is what generates our final a uh, high fidelity image. And in previous works in 2021, like we mentioned before, this, this paper is quite old, um, it's old as in 2021, uh, used a, a model type our group actually previously discussed called uh, DPMs, diffusion probabilistic models, um, to a conditional image generation and perform super resolution through a stochastic iterative noising process, um, which they called SR3 in Sharia's paper. Uh, which was implemented here in ours today. So the cascading pipeline follows a directional process. Uh, we identify the class label and use it as a conditional mechanism into our models. Uh, first, the model is a class, condi class conditional <clears throat> model and is followed by a sequence of two super resolution class conditional models. A major benefit to training a cascading pipeline over a standard model at the highest resolution is that, or on the lower resolution rather than the higher resolution, is that most of the modeling capacity and, um, and efficiency is dedicated to the lower resolutions, which empirically uh, is the most important for sample quality. And training this on the low sample resolutions tends to be the most efficient. So moving on to the conditional augmentation, but quickly here's a reminder of some of the foundations. Um, the current best architectures used for image diffusion models utilize UNet architecture. And as previously mentioned, they cited Sharia et al. Uh, in 2021 as a model they decided to implement. Uh, and here's a quick visual reminder of that UNet architecture um, that they shared. So the research proposed three main efforts uh, for this conditioning, like we discussed a little bit prior, uh, blur, truncated, and non-truncated. Um, the truncated conditioning augmentation refers to the truncating of the removal 
of a portion of the low resolution reverse process to stop at a specified uh, time step. So like we said before, um, our goal is to generate a higher resolution, resolution image from the lower base. Uh, but in order to create that, we start with our low resolution data uh, classified as Z, Z sub zero, um, and then move on to, and our goal is to reach our higher resolution uh, X sub zero. Um, we use a cascading pipeline to refer to a sequence of these models, degenerative models. Uh, starting at the low resolution where we apply our diffusion process, denoted as P uh, sub zero. And then feeding that into the super resolution model denoted as, as such. So generating a high resolution sample is performed using uh, is what's called ancestral sampling. Uh, in other words, using just prior samples as new inputs to the model. And they use the sampling from the latent variable model, which is assumed to have uh, the same number of time steps uh, as the low resolution and super resolution models applied. The cascading pipeline forms a uh, latent variable model for our high resolution data noted as such. Uh, as you probably noticed, we have our super resolution integrated or a super resolution model integrated, uh, which is oriented as the goal of the repeated or uh, quote cascaded utility of these functions through uh, iteration uh, up to T. So we introduce uh, the S variable as the point of stop, uh, stop limit to refer to the truncation of the low resolution reverse process to stop at that time. So um, the removal or truncation of some time steps between zero and uh, S and T have an effect on the overall performance and efficiency of the model, and which Shushapan and Vijay had previously dived deep into. Thank you.